Good evening, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo College. And welcome to the Folks Conversation Series. Tonight, a conversation on Leonard Cohen. Many of you may remember the iconic singer, songwriter, poet, and novelist from Canada. Uh, died five years ago in a few weeks. It's his fifth year anniversary of his death. And we thought, why, why not spend a night thinking about Leonard Cohen, hearing some of his music and engaged in interesting conversation about him and the lyrics and the, his life. Um, before we uh, start, we're gonna start with some music. Uh, I just wanna say welcome the uh, Facebook Live audience. Thanks for see watching us live. Facebook, if you want to uh, receive updated information about future upcoming events, please go to folks.org. Uh, if you uh, want to leave a question for one of the six, let's see, four, four guests that we have here tonight, you can do that in the Q&A box. We'll see if there's some time. Uh, and in the chat box, you know, we're, we're also here for a reason. There's a new book published uh, from one of our guests, Marsha Pally. She's just publishing a book. And I think Thursday it's released uh, from this Broken Hill I Sing to You, God, Sex, and Politics and the Work of Leonard Cohen. If you're interested in Marsha's book and I recommend it to you, you can purchase it uh, in the chat box. But before any other conversation, I think we should just start with uh, a song. Uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, very briefly uh, Peter Himmelman, who is an Emmy and Grammy and nominated uh, musician and a man who's a friend of mine for years and a man of eclectic tastes and talent. And he will be accompanied by uh, the legendary David Amram, and they will be performing Bird on the Wire. And then after that, we'll, get, we'll meet the rest of our guests. Enjoy it. Peter, David, the, the stage is yours. Like a bird on the wire Like a drum in a midnight choir I have tried In my way To be free Like a worm On a hook Like a knight From some old-fashioned book I have saved All my ribbons And if I, if I've been unkind I hope that you can just let it all go by And if I, if I've been untrue I hope you know it was all never to you Like a baby still born Like a beast with his horn I have torn everyone who reached out Why not ask for more? 
or lack of blood on a wire like a drum in a midnight choir I have tried in my way to be free I have tried in my way to be free Peter, David, that was exquisite. That was Peter Himmelman on vocals and the legendary David Amram accompany him. Uh, let's meet the two other uh, guests here for tonight. Let's see, put everyone on the screen. Madeline, uh, we have Carol Gilligan with us tonight. Many of you know her. She's a noted psychologist, feminist, iconic author of a, a, a groundbreaking book in a different voice. And probably the, at least America's leading expert on the emotional and psychological development of young women. Carol, so happy that you're here with us. Thank you for joining us. Um, David uh, Amram, who was accompanying uh, uh, Peter and who you will uh, eventually hear sing as well in about 25 minutes or so. Uh, if you don't know him, I'll tell you very briefly, uh, he's a, a conductor and a composer He's conducted 35 different uh, uh, orchestras around the world. Uh, he is a multi-instrumentalist. He scored, I think, 23 Broadway plays, dozens of TV shows, um, and a collaborator with Bob Dylan and Thelonious Monk and, let's see, Dizzy Gillespie and Willie Nelson, Arlo Guthrie, Tito Puente. Yes, that's the great David Amram. He'll be with us. You'll see, hear him sing and speak as well. And last but not least, the great Marsha Pally, who is one of the reasons we're assembled here tonight. She has this new book, as I said before, From This Broken Hill, I Sing to You, uh, God, Sex, and Politics in the Work of Leonard Cohen. She's a professor uh, at Fordham uh, and at uh, NYU. And I forgot to mention that Carol is a, a distinguished uh, university professor at NYU. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this special night, folks' conversation. Uh, I'm going to start with the gentleman uh, who just finished uh, this performance. Um, you know, uh, people, not everyone knows, uh, uh, Leonard Cohen didn't get his recording career together until he was in his early 30s. Most pop stars at that point or rock and roll stars would be finished. He just got started. He was writing poetry and novels in his 20s. Uh, he said he wasn't a good singer. He said he wasn't a good musician. Why is this man so revered around the world? Why has his music been so widely covered? Uh, why has he been uh, so influential? Uh, tell us as musicians. Well, knowing Leonard, as I was blessed to do, he had what's known as purity of intent and an exquisite choice of notes. He worked with his limitations. He did more singing in one octave than most of us can do in a lifetime. Even, even if you would agree with him that he wasn't technically great, you're saying that there was something distinctive about his voice. Oh, he was saying something and his poetry mm. is so beautiful. He's what they call deceptively simple. So <laughs> he did the final strongs of Richard Strauss after he wrote The Spagus Arothustra and Terleiter Spiegel and you hear or see Matisse's final paintings they're so seemingly simple. And yet when you see right. Leonard and this, this song that I'm going to do, I said, wow. Wow. Know. Peter, Peter, do you have something you want, might want to add to, to explain? Well, I, mean, I, yeah. I know that I know that Bob Dylan, just I was someone that you have a very close relationship to. Uh, Bob Dylan said that he thought he was the world's greatest songwriter, Leonard Cohen. He, con he concluded himself, I think, as well but he had thought of himself the way. And he, com he also thought that Leonard Cohen was a great melody maker and yeah. that he didn't get hey, credit. He didn't get enough credit as a melody maker. I wonder whether, and in fact, he compared him in that way to, uh, to Irving Berlin. Well, in some ways, first of all, thinking about, you know, Bob Dylan, just to, on a tangent, you know, everyone knows that he's quite the wordsmith, but, you know, what they don't really understand, most people, 
is uh, first of all, it's very, very difficult to write a convincing song where, wherein one can just sit and play it on a guitar and it has an effect. Um, so many things have to come together, have to coalesce at the same time. And it takes, aside from the lyrics themselves, we can talk about in a second, just the musicianship, the harmonies. Um, in Leonard's case, there is, as David was saying, there's a deceptiveness to it. It sounds so simple, but there's always these unexpected chord changes in there. So I was kind of learning some of these songs and like, oh, that's really unusual and really strange. It sounds kind of like a simple folk song, but there's a complexity to it. There's a subtlety and it perfectly meshes with the lyrics. As far as uh, Leonard as a singer, singing is, uh, it's, you know, you can't look at Pavarotti and apply it to, to what Leonard Cohen was doing. And you would you make the same argument, I guess, about Bob Dylan as well? Well, I mean, right? Bob Dylan is an, an amazing singer. And what makes him an amazing singer, what makes Leonard Cohen an amazing singer, or Mick Jagger for that matter, is that their phrasing sounds, you know, if you take an average person, maybe they're not quite professional, the first thing you'll hear that any anyone a novice can hear this something's not right it isn't so much the intonation it's the phrasing and you're saying phrasing is also what they used to say about frank sinatra so I mean, let me let both. me just let me just move off this topic we'll come back um marcia uh in the book in your book you refer a number of times to cohen as if he had a, a prophetic voice tell us what you think that means um uh, you know, the book is filled, his lyrics and your book points out a lot of biblical imagery, but is it's not just the use of biblical imagery. There must be something else there that you credit as having the voice of a prophet. I didn't think he had a prophetic voice. He did. He ah, was so I was just going to say to you, I know most prophets in the Bible don't want the job. Leonard Cohen seems to want that job. He also wanted the job of priest and saw them as mirror images of the other, of each other. The priest repre um, represents God to the people and complains to the people that, um, about God's bereftness. And the prophet represents the people to God and complains to God um, of the people's uh, hunger or worldly miseries but but this is a slim feature uh, as you asked for the really running through line that goes through 60 years of his songs poems two novels which is his conviction passionate conviction that we are we humanity are created for relationship with the transcendent he called it god and with each other at the same time um, and his self-image as prophet and priest come from this through line and his dismay unto tragedy that we break the relationships that we ourselves need to flourish. We blame and you're saying, right. In fact, it's the title of your book, The Word Brokenness. Is a, is a big theme. We'll definitely talk about that as well. I'm wondering whether, and maybe we can ask you just broadly, all of you, given the fact what Marcia just said, that it was his aspiration to think of himself as both prophet and priest, does anyone actually think that he succeeded in that regard? He, in I'll, other words, yeah, I'll go ahead. In briefly, and other people can opine. Um, he, he, he did talk of himself as channeling uh, concerns, struggles, messages that, that are, are all of ours, mm. that our struggle for relationship with each other in our personal lives, in our political lives, our struggle for relationship with the transcendent, whatever that means to you, uh, our concerns that we all have and our breaking of our relationships, our inconstancies, our betrayals. Right. Well, our, 
are all of ours. And I think one of the reasons that he speaks to people uh, for many, many decades is the beautiful music and phrasing and so on that, that Peter and David, have yeah. been, but also because what he wrote about right. resonates the problems and struggles that most of us have. Carol, I want to get you to talk a little about something Marcia just said about betrayals and brokenness. You know, I wonder whether, I, you know, there's so many reasons to ask you this question, but you are also a psychologist. Can we put Lenny Cohen, Leonard Cohen on the couch? Uh, if you read, if you listen to his music, you read his lyrics and his poetry. Um, and of course, Marsha points out repeatedly in the book, you know, he uh, failed miserably and he acknowledges in his personal life, in his relationship, to, especially to women and in the book, Marsha points out that the, he's very self-confessional about that. So I wonder, two things, I wonder whether we can, he can be diagnosed in some way his, a, a, as an, a personality of a betrayal, abandonment, brokenness. And on top of that, I wonder whether that's even fair to do, whether it's fair to do that to an artist, to take their music or to take their novels and to mm -hmm. read too much into them as to who they were as people. But there's two questions. Yes, they're hard ones too. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, to me, um, and this is not in any sense a diagnosis, it's a description. Um, mm. Because he gave, he gave voice, uh, as Marcia said. Uh, I mean, he gave ex exquisite voice to a struggle over the issue of relationship. Of, I mean, even Bird on a Wire, it's about being free. And um, so how would I just, I mean, what does he come across? He's a man. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's a diagnosis? Okay. <laughs> well, I was thinking, it's funny you said that. I'm going to ask you another question later that's going to bear more, even more directly on that. So I, I love that. What about this other idea that I asked you about? Uh, is it fair to read into an artist's work and, and essentially say that that is reveals who he or she was, who what they chose to write about. Marsha's uh, nodding her head no. Uh, I wonder only, if you have some thought. Only because, and I'm gonna throw the ball back to Carol, only because one doesn't have to read these things into Leonard Cohen's lyrics. They come out at you yeah. in cascades from the lyrics and the poems. Uh, both the passionate commitment to God, to women, to others, and also the struggle with betraying those commitments. So, Carol. Do you agree, you must agree with that, Carol, that, that, that there's, it, this isn't a matter of reading too uh, finely into the art, it's just there. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's if you ask a question, it's a literary question, who's yeah. speaking? Yeah. Who's speaking and to whom? And this is a man speaking. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's, you know, um, maybe, maybe in a way, um, you can say who's speaking and to whom, who's listening. I'm yeah. hearing it as a woman and I hear it as a man's struggle with a desire, an intense desire for relationship with God and with women and an intense desire to be free of these relationships. And so the kind of thing. And, and not only to be free, but I think Marsha would say, succeed at being free, yeah. right? Because he, yeah. he, he was so good at breaking things that he, it wasn't like he was stuck. He, 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 he moved, he bolted very quickly. Uh, Marsha, I'll come back to you on that. Let me just go back to Peter and David. Uh, people always ask this question, like I, it goes back to the point that you said about phrasing. Yeah, but I wanna go back to the fact that here's a guy, he was not uh, professionally trained as a musician. He didn't get his recording career going until he was 33 years old. I mean, I wonder whether both of you who've, who clearly were trained at an earlier age find that extraordinary in and of itself that he was a novelist slash poet who taught himself how to play the guitar. Uh, and then this, the, the, this, the, the second question is, what kind of a performer was he? Was he a crooner? Was he a torch song singer? Uh, was he a pop star? Uh, was he a rock star? Uh, he definitely brought a suit and a tie and a hat uh, to rock music, if you call it rock music. He's not Tony Bennett, 
we refer to him in, in phrasing. I'm just curious, what do you think of him in that regard? Well, I mean, um, he's a smart guy. So, you know, and he had, a, he had, you know, tremendous accolades for his poetry. He might have played guitar as a, you know, a kid. It doesn't take, it doesn't take a great leap of, uh, you know, understanding to me to see how he could pick up a guitar and learn it and, and learn to play very well at, at 33 years old or whatever it was. It, mm -hmm. None of that strikes me as uh, unusual at all. And what he did, as you described, Thane, he, he worked within his limitations. Um, I always think about if somebody were to give Picasso uh, a piece of charcoal and, and, a, and you know, a piece of cardboard, well, no one's going to expect colors. He, he's he's going to do what he does with these rudimentary tools. And in some way, those tools, the circumscription of them yeah. will lead to something beautiful. And he became, you know, something that nobody had ever seen or no one can quite classify. Um, going back a little bit to, to something that Carol was mentioning and thinking about and, and, and your question of, you know, what can we read into him as an artist? Well, one thing that you, it, it would do us well to bear in mind, um, you know, artists use their imagination. So primarily it's a, it's, it's a feature of imagination. We, my wife and I met with Charles Simic, the great poet from mm -hmm. Serbia. And, you know, he said, people ask me, are you this? He said, it's, 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 it's imagination. Now, mm -hmm. obviously your imagination is fueled by your life experiences. It's also fueled by, by a sense of, I'm going to be writing for an audience. So there is a sense of saying things that he finds will be connective and people will find, quote, mysterious. It's all in there. It's both mm -hmm. feeding the ego, it's feeding the imagination. None of it is, in that sense, surprising. He's I a see. very smart guy. He, would, he could probably become, you know, a, a veterinarian of, of some renown. <laughs> <laughs> David, can we, if, unless you have something you want to add, can we hear your rendition of Sisters of Mercy? Yeah, if I can just say a word. Yes, please. This instrument that I'm using, the played in Buddhist music from China called the Hulosai, and when I use some of the beautiful chords that Leonard used, I'm using a scale coming from his Jewish background, which he felt as much as Buddhism so deeply, Yeah, and the blues and American music. And we have to remember, he was in the most brutal scene known as pop music. And somehow he survived that and organized, franchised, Burger Kingized versions of Judaism and Buddhism. <laughs> well, we'll get, we'll get to that as well. Somehow remain true to that to himself. So his category is Leonard Cohen. And this <laughs> is a beautiful song called Sisters of Mercy. And he wrote, he was so proud of this because it was the only song that he ever wrote in one sitting. He invited two young women who needed a place to stay to his place. They slept in the double bed together. He sat on the couch and wrote the song. And this was the one thing in his That's life where he didn't have a failed relationship. He had no relationship except being a beautiful, soulful And person. it resulted in this. Which Great, David. And, Let's and, hear it. Okay. Great. Thanks, David. Sure. I just wanted to mention that. No, no, I'm glad you did.
the sisters of mercy. They are not departed or gone. They were waiting for me. And I thought they just couldn't go on. And they brought me their comfort. Later, they brought me the song. Oh, I hope you run into them. You who've been traveling so long. Yes, you who must leave everything you cannot control. Begins with your family, soon it comes round to your soul. I've been hanging, I know where you've been hanging, I think. I see now how you're pinned. When you're not feeling holy, your loneliness says that you sinned. They lay down beside me. I made my confession to them. I, they touched both my eyes, and I touched the dew of their hem. If your life is a leaf. They will bind you with love that is graceful, green as a stem. Well, I left when they were sleeping. I hope you run into them soon. Don't turn on the lights. You can read their dress by the moon. And you won't make me jealous If I hear that they sweetened your night We weren't lovers like that Besides, it would still be all right We weren't lovers like that And besides, it would still be all right Beautiful, David. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for that wonderful accompaniment, Peter. Hey, Marsha, what, what is it about brokenness that as a running theme was so important to him? Obviously, you've detected it in the, po is it, first of all, does it exist in the poetry and in the novels as well? Is it in everything? And why is it there? Before I plunge into that, I, I think I, I need to straighten out just a couple of things. Um, Leonard Cohen didn't learn to write, play the guitar at 33. He had a band in high school called the Buckskin Boys and um, knew how to play musical instruments through um, most of his life, though he didn't start recording as a professional until he was 33. The other thing that I think it's worth pointing out is um, 
is that Len Leonard Cohen struggled for a relationship with God and with women, and also, as you know, had a substantial analysis of our political sins as broken relationships. He knew that his broken, that his inability to sustain relationship was not a strength. It was a fault. It was a fault. Um, I'm so sorry, I didn't hear that. It was a what? I'm sorry. Fault. Fault, fault. And, or a flaw. It was his flaw. He thought of himself as the covenant failure par excellence. His fault, our fault, fault, our flaw, humanity's flaw. He didn't think it was a strength and struggled against, against that. Coming at the end of his life, not to a neat wrap it up all in a bow resolution, but to coming to some complex recognition and, and acceptance that we are indeed relational, both with the transcendent and with women. He said that uh, in his 70s, until I was 65, I never saw the woman standing there. I only saw uh, a miracle, right? And, yeah. and not a person to bond with. You can't make a relationship with an icon you can't make a relationship with God if you make God into an icon or with a woman. But, so, uh, and, and yet just at it, 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 the end of his life, and Carol and I have talked about this, he did have a relationship with Anjani Thomas where the female subject starts to come through in, um, in the songs like A Street. Well, let, me, let me get back to Carol on this based on what Marsha just said and get what you said earlier about he's a man. Um, uh, because I, this, is, this picks up on this. I know that in your own work, you've done work on the relationship between the sexes and the dynamics and why there's an impasse at some point. And one thing I think that comes out of Marsha's book is that his feelings about women, at least in art, are more romanticized. As you said, Marsha just used the word uh, like, like icon or uh, you know, the idolatry but that there was criticism about his lyrics that he, the, the women were not fully realized, right? That they were really just romanticized, that he saw them as just vessels, objects. And I wonder whether you think that is another example of, this is the impasse between the sexes. There's nothing unique here about Leonard Cohen. This is what the relationship is between men and women anyway. You know, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember the other word like in the last song the word soul comes in. And so he's very concerned about his soul. And there's a sense in Leonard Cohn that there's a tension between his relationship with his soul, with himself, and then these relationships which sort of stand in the way in some sense. So that's the struggle of how to preserve his soul and then also be in relationship with whether it's women or God or so forth. And, you know, um, that sense of, uh, I mean, when, when I wrote In a Different Voice and the title of my book is In a Different Voice, not in, it was not in a woman's voice, it's a different voice. It's a voice that joins soul and relationship rather than seeing them as somehow engaged in this kind of, you know, unending cosmic struggle with constant fears of betrayal. Because the other thing, I hear in the songs too is he's always also, it seems to me, uh, giving voice to his desire to somehow justify his leaving of relationships because it's necessary for his soul or it's necessary for his art. And, uh, you know, so I think what, what Marsha captures is that's a problematic for him. I see. But, but that's, that's what he's concerned about. Peter, I they Okay. I can just jump in here, just just with um, Peggy backing right off of what Carol said. He, um, I think the tension is between, and this is very clear in his work, even in an early work in a very famous work like Suzanne, he saw women at once as a portal to the soul, as a portal to the spiritual, and then yet feared what that commitment would require that it would puncture autonomy or intactness and then bolted. 
So there's, it, it's, not, uh, it's not soul on one side and women on another, but women as part of the ecstatic spiritual experience, which also is overwhelming. We have the word awe for both, for awe, for God, for women, and, uh, and then needing to bolt. But is that, is that a, just briefly, is that showing respect for women or is using them as mere vessels? In other words, is that show a sense of individual respect? Because you just said it before, it wasn't until later in life that he had a very different kind of relationship. What I hear you saying, though, is that that same desire for the connection, the covenant, the contract with the divine, he was also, as Carolyn, you were saying, using sex, eros, and women as, as, a, as a transport. Yeah. Uh, David I, and, and Peter, I'm curious, it's an ongoing question. David already raised it it's, uh, earlier. Uh, do you consider him a Jewish artist? Here's a guy who said for his entire life that he kept Shabbat on Friday nights. Uh, he, as Marsha points out throughout the book, repeatedly uses you know, imagery, refers to Hineni, I am here. This comes right out of the words of Abraham to God. Hineni is there. The Shekhinah, the feminine of God, uh, is mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, biblical uh, imagery, and yet he spent six years in a monastery and is a Buddhist monk. Do you think, do you think of him as a Jewish artist? And do you think that being Jewish is very represented entirely in all of the work that he's done? Well, I always felt that way before I met him. And when I was the first composer in residence with Leonard Bernstein, Bernstein, after we got to know each other, confessed how much he loved Leonard Cohen's poetry and his music because he was telling his story in his way and he had a relationship with Buddhism and with popular music in the same way that Leonard Bernstein did and Leonard Bernstein after he wrote West Side Story, that became an albatross around his neck. Because they right. said, how could someone be a serious composer and conductor who not Brahms, Beethoven, and Afro-Cuban music? Well, right. Bernstein understood that, and he saw the antipathy between what Lenny Bruce refers to as religious as incorporated and spirituality. And I think that the reason why Leonard loved Buddhism was he felt that that was probably the modern version of Buddhism was the most spiritual way a person could humbly, respectfully, and lovingly live and excuse their own imperfections. He was very concerned about being a holy person, which none right. of us can be, and he right. was upset by that, and his songs reflect that, and that's one reason why we can identify with him, because he was human, and ultimately Peter. a real mensch, in the best meaning of that word. Peter, you have something to add on that? Yeah, I have a couple things to say. I mean, um, you know, I might backtrack a little. First of all, uh, as a, you know, if you're Jewish and you're a writer, you're a Jewish writer. You don't have to be writing like Shalom Aleichem. I mean, it's just who you are, and your experiences may be this or that. I mean, that to me, that's almost a settled question. Of course, he was a Jewish artist. I mean, uh, Gene Simmons from Kiss is a Jewish artist too. If you want to include him in, in artistry. The other thing is um, this kind of wrestling with the portals of the transcendent and so on. Leonard Cohn was a rock star. He had a lot of women throwing themselves at him. In some sense, he's not any different than a, than a great country artist who's who's writing about, you know, debauchery on Saturday night and going to the church on Sunday. It's very simple. It isn't quite uh, as magisterial as you'd think. I mean, it's nice to read that stuff into things. Um, and as you said, you know, Buddhism, he was into Buddhism. It was a, a more pure spirituality. It, 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 this is my opinion on these things. Judaism requires a lot of rules and a lot of regulations particularly around sexuality. So it would be easy for me to say, yeah, I mean, Buddhism is a pure root, uh, depending on what it is you're after. In other words, Judaism's regulations, to my mind, are very much so like the piano. It has 88 keys. You, you're, you're playing right. it in a very conventional way. 
you're learning at least in a conventional way, you have to learn how to play it within those structures in order to be able to create. And that, and that itself is infinitely. And this Jew, is a metaphor Jewish, that I would right. use for you know what I thought like, this, this oh. so-called confines is the route to transcendence. Uh -huh. um, when Peter said wrestling, and I thought where you were going to go, because if I thought, how do I, what is so Jewish, what feels so Jewish to me about Leonard Cohen is he's wrestling with God. Mm. I mean, and yes, that's right out of Jacob in the Bible. Yeah, and that I mean, seems to me that sense of personally wrestling with God, uh, it, it that that feels Jewish to me. I mean, it's a, it's appealing. I mean, you know, like I said, the guy who's so the country guy's is doing it too, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, mean, I think not in, there's in something it. about Leonard's doing that feels, I mean, I mean again, he does I'm, it in, a, in a very artful way. You yeah. know? Right, as David said, he's Leonard Cohen. That's one unique voice. That's Mark right. Shaw, I, I want to take you back to a conversation we had decades ago. <laughs> uh, because you refer, you refer to Leonard as also uh, addressing the Holocaust uh, in his work. And I remember many years ago, we had this conversation about, you know, Hollywood films that require sort of life affirming feel good endings. And it's clear that that is not Leonard Cohen's problem. And he was not felt that being, you know, happy songs was not what he was necessarily uh, interested in. Uh, and I, so I, I wanna talk about that, you know, the sort of that he defied that convention. But in addition to that, he broke a rule, right? Because as you point out in your book, Theodore Adorno's, uh, uh, you know, dictum, no poetry after Auschwitz says, don't use an atrocity to make aesthetics. And I think in your book, you mentioned, well, he didn't credit himself as being in the aesthetics business, but he was in the aesthetics business. Everyone here tonight has said he was in the aesthetics business. So I'm wondering about that, A, the somberness to his music and B, uh, this rule that he seemed to have violated several times, if you, if it is a rule that Theodore Adorno of writing about the Holocaust, and then maybe we'll double back to David, because I know David did an opera about the Holocaust. And so maybe David can respond to this too. Marsha? Um, before I plunge into that, I think I should straighten or, or attempt one or two comments on Jew Judaism and Buddhism. Uh, Leonard Cohen had no doubt any time in his life of his commitment to Judaism and said so over and over and over again in interviews for 50 years. Um, he also wrote, as you know, the famous um, line, I'm the little Jew who wrote the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he spoke of Buddhism as a, as a uh, practice of discipline of uh, how one disciplines one's mind, one's hours during the day. But he was very clear and said over and over again, and this is pretty much a quote, um, I, have a, I have a perfectly wonderful religion, it's called Judaism, and it has answered all the theological questions. And in fact, I just, you just reminded me, I think, Peter, you must know this, that he had this relationship with Bob Dylan, but he was critical of Bob Dylan's conversion to Christianity. Am I right about this? I have no idea, but all right. I threw. I hope I'm. I hope I'm right. There's one. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell about a time that I spent with with Leonard. He was in the in the San Fernando Valley, and it, it to me it spoke of his sense of humor. He's you know and and almost his sort of subtle comment on people I you know idolizing him. So it was it was you know nominally sort of a Torah class, and they were studying Job. And, and there was a circle of different musicians and people who were sort of worshipful of, of Leonard Cohen. He was sort of on a high stool. He was being served grapes, I think, you know. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden he piped in, and to me it was very theatrical. And he said in his low voice about the story of Job, God is evil. <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, I was kind of observing and everyone was watching and the rabbi sort of parroted and he goes, God is evil. <laughs> the bass player of renown goes, God is evil. And, a, and a, an actress of note, she turned to me and she goes, this is, she wasn't maybe Jewish or stuff. She goes, what is this? I'm like, 
just watch. Just go with it. <laughs> like just playing this thing. It just kind of showed about you know people's response to to fame, the power of it. That that even a rabbi would parrot something like right. that. Right from a guy eating grapes. Right. Uh, but Marsha, I'm wondering. You know, you know, Peter, I'm so glad, Peter, you told that story because that's it's, it's funny, but it's not entirely funny. I there knew. Are, I, go ahead. Yes, this is what I was going to ask you. Lyrics and poems where um, Cohen is angry at God, and he makes that very clear. Carol uh, mentioned uh, wrestling with God. You've mentioned wrestling with God. Um, atheists don't wrestle with God. Hundred percent. You wrestle with God when you are convinced you are in a relationship with God, however complex and tortured that may be. And he is in throughout his writing. He's angry at God. He gives voice to God being angry with humanity for breaking covenant relationship. He gets angry at God for making us creatures who need relationship and so easily able to break it. What kind of God is that? And that's also part of Leonard Cohen's struggle with God. And it's a, a, a something that many of us struggle with. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there evil in the world? Why did God make us for relationship and so easily able to screw it up? And that that is a, a part of this um, theme of relationship and covenant that I trace through from this broken hill. Yeah. I think it's a you, it's a really interesting point that you bring up, and it 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 is almost the most Jewish thing of all. You 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 make the point. You're not angry at a God that you disbelieve in. My sister was killed in a car crash, and I'm a pretty observant Jew, so people ask me, "Well, do you still believe in God?" To me, it was kind of a ridiculous question because here's the world and everything. But I was really angry. All my prayers had a lot of anger in them every day until I realized that the creator of sorrow must also have this infinite sorrow. And the anger kind of turned into a, a mercy for God, which I try to carry with me. Marsha, because you, you do say in the book that he holds God accountable. You use the word blame. Uh, that, that, but he also, this must be essentially the theology of Leonard Cohen, right? I mean, it's one of the things that, one of the pleasures of reading your book is that it is in some ways a book of theology and it looks critically at all of the music, poetry, the lyrics, the novels, and, 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 and creates out of that a theology. Yeah. Could I? I'm, uh, David. Oh, I'm sorry. One, one comment. Yeah, think, sorry, Marsha. Hold it. Just David. I think Leonard had a heads up because he was from Canada. In Canada, they believe in the mosaic as opposed to the melting pot. So therefore, when he came to New York City, being from Canada, that was already five strikes against him. Being Jewish was not that much of a help because at the time that he came, most of the people who were successful who were of a Jewish background, either changed their name or tried to ignore that. He felt this was part of his heritage, and because of being a real mensch, which is a Yiddish word for a real ben adam in Hebrew person, human being, he respected everyone else's heritage and was respected by people of all heritages because he didn't deny himself. And one of the things we talked about was how when you had six different Jewish people in a room, there'd be 13 opinions because we love to argue not only with God, but with one another. And then we would take the other side of the argument and that was part of what we were known for and what enables us to survive for so many thousands of years of being able to be flexible, interested, intuitive, no rules and then break them find new rules, go back to the old rules, and realize that we were just here for a while. And in a certain way, becoming a Jewish person means that you're humbled and you're interested in every single person on earth and their background. That's what Leonard was like as Mark. a person. And, and, and the, in the music industry, he was an elegant gentleman in a sea of incredible slime mm -hmm. and somehow managed to keep that and he maintains his Jewishness when a lot of successful Jewish people thought it was an embarrassment. 
Marsha, he respected yeah. Buddhism because no, he thought that these were spiritual no. people. I believe Leonard was a spiritual person. Yeah. Most first and foremost, and that's what his neshama, his soul, oh. appeals to everybody and anybody because we're all until they discover. Mar Marsha, I'm going to give you the last word before we go into the duet. We're almost coming to the end of the night. Uh, so choose wisely what you want to. Because you, you, it feels like you were cut off on a number of things you wanted to say. Not, not at all. This has been great. Um, uh, he, Leonard Cohen did say that a great religion respects all religions. A great people respects all people. A great race respects all race, uh, races, etc. And uh, the figure of Jesus was also very important in his work uh, as a as a fully human being who did not break, betray, bolt from relationship. Right. He was committed both to God and to perp to people. Uh, and so uh, I think I, I think if you're giving me the last word. Well, actually, I have, I have a one last question for uh, for Carol. So we'll decide how you want to divide this plunge, up. Plunge in. Yeah, one last and then come back and I'll come right back to you for the last word and then we'll do do duet. Carol, I was just wondering uh, if you can help maybe explain to the audience, what is it about music uh, in the human psyche that's so powerful? Uh, why is it a separate art form that is it, for some people that it touches them in a way that other art forms do not? Has there been much of psychological research on just what it is about music? This is a guy that in his 80s did a world tour uh, and uh, and he was people came from all over the world. He sold out arenas. Well, first of all, I think because music touches our feelings um, so I mean so deeply, and then the human voice. I mean, this is the this is the voice, and um, it, it's just if you think about and and then if we go back to the jewish tradition i mean god is is a voice it's a breath it's 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 less imagistic but it's mm -hmm. much more i mean the the prayer that a jew says every day shema hear o israel i mean it's about listening so yes i think music can touch us can reach us uh in in ways that are beyond words and i think we know right. that right right marsha last word and then we'll get into the duet I, I think that what I've learned most from spending intimate years with Leonard Cohen, I mean, after he died and with his work, um, is, is, the, is the importance of covenant with the transcendent and with each other, and with the importance of looking at our own abilities to variously hold covenantal commitment relationship also in our political understanding, and to also own up to our struggles with breaking and leaving it. And I think if we're going to talk, uh, to, to hear now, everyone knows, is that right, Peter? Is yes, that right? that's what we're about to hear. That um, Then I'd, I'll do a little lead into that by saying that is, that is in some say a template to understanding Cohen's big picture worldview. He begins, he, it, 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 it addresses our breaches politically, our breaches in our personal lives and our breaches with God. He begins with politics, he slithers into personal relationships and he ends with the tragedies that we find ourselves in by breaching all three of those relationships politically, personally, and with God. And I think we should be ready for everybody. Perfect. Now. All right, this is Peter Himmelman and, and David Amram's rendition of Everybody Knows. Everybody knows the dice are loaded Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed Everybody knows that the war is over Everybody knows the good guys lost Everybody knows 
the fight was fixed The poor stay poor and the rich get rich That's how it goes Everybody knows Everybody knows that the boat is leaking Everybody knows that the captain lied Everybody got this broken feeling Like the father or the dog just died Everybody talking to their pockets Everybody wants a box of chocolates Or a long stem rose mm, Everybody Everybody knows that you love me, baby Everybody knows that you really do Everybody knows that you've been faithful I'll give a night or two Everybody knows you've been discreet There were so many people you had to meet Without your clothes Everybody knows Everybody knows, everybody knows, that's how it goes, everybody knows, everybody knows if it's now or never, everybody knows if it's me or you, everybody knows that you live forever, ah, when you've done a line or two, everybody knows the deal is right. Old Black Joe's still picking that cotton for your ribbons and bows. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. Wow, that was awesome. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, David. That was great. Um, I'm going to say goodnight to our guests before we say uh, goodnight uh, to our audience. Uh, remember, Marsha's book is on sale, I think, on Thursday. Uh, and you can go to the chat box uh, and purchase it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an important read. And hopefully tonight uh, it inspired what already Leonard uh, Cohen fans there are everywhere. <laughs> to look more deeply into the theology and the politics and the sex of Leonard Cohen's work. I wanna say thank you to Carol Gilligan. I wanna thank David, of course, and Peter and Marsha Pally. I'm Thane Rosenbaum until next time at Folks. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.